Uh, you've had a little bit of time now to let those ideas kind of percolate, let them circulate through your mind and think about them. And so I want to clarify what I was really emphasizing in this last class. What I mean by everything that we've seen so far, that God is a God of vengeance, but we can't have vengeance, judging, anger. We can't have that be part of our thinking. What I mean by that is when you feel angry, you have to say, well, you can't be angry. Now, I, you know, you might feel like, whoa, you know, that's pretty extreme. But I think that's what scripture is telling us. I think that, you know, when we have those times in ecclesial life where we get frustrated with somebody and we think, I do well to be angry, right? I should be angry. You know, look at what they're doing in the ecclesia, this and this, that we have to tell ourselves, but the servant of the Lord must not strive and must be gentle unto all men. This anger is not part of the character that God is developing in us. And so what that means is that even when we look at our anger and we say, aha, this is righteous anger, right? I feel righteous anger over the situation that's happening in society. Or I feel righteous anger over what is happening in the ecclesial life right now. Or I feel righteous anger over what's happening in my family, you know, whatever it might be, that we have to say, no, actually I don't. Because there is no place for righteous anger in our lives. Righteous anger is God's anger. Righteous anger is the Lord's anger. Righteous anger is what inspires those imprecatory songs. But it's not what we do. And so that's why Paul can say things like, put away all bitterness, wrath, malice from you because those emotions aren't supposed to have a part in our lives so if you feel like that's extreme well you know maybe it is but i think that's what we are being told to do and so we're going to see in this class how do we do that you know uh for some of us just saying well i can't be angry that might not work very well. So, so how do we actually, you know, get rid of this anger, get rid of this desire to judge and be frustrated with people? And that's what this class is about. So here we are in class number three, and we are going to be talking about how judging should be replaced with humility. So we've seen that it's part of God's character. It's not part of ours. And so we have to completely get rid of it. Righteous anger is not a thing for us. So instead, we replace it with humility. So once again, three parts to the class. We are going to talk about Matthew chapter 5, uh, where this, this title comes from, Be Perfect, and what we read already. So we're going to talk about the background of Matthew 5. We're going to discuss what it means then to follow God according to Matthew chapter 5, and how pride and humility bring about the kind of attitude that God wants. I should back up there. How replacing pride with humility brings about the kind of attitude that God wants. I'm, I, I don't mean to be prideful, that we should be prideful. So we're gonna see that judging should be replaced with humility. And the question that we wanna ask here is why does humility matter so much? You know, Why is it such an important key piece here? So that's what we hope to see. All right. So the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. So the question is, how do we do that, right? How do we live in meekness? You know, Paul says in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. What's that look like? How do we do it? Um, you know, it, it, it's helpful to not just be told, act like this, but to be given examples of it. And I think that's actually what we see in Matthew chapter five, because he's teaching the people now, this is how God wants you to live. So we're going to take a look at the background of Matthew chapter 5, right? This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I would suggest to you that it has a specific Old Testament basis. I mean, that, that's the Lord, isn't it? He was the Word made flesh. So like everything he said, weave together all of these different Old Testament passages. 
And I, I just think that's astonishing. And that's one of the things that I love, you know, trying to figure out where are the different places in the Old Testament that the Lord Jesus is taking his ideas from. And so when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, I would suggest to you that the Lord Jesus bases the Sermon on the Mount on Psalm 15. So as we're going to see, Psalm 15 not only has similarities in the language that's used, so like the words in Psalm 15 are similar to what the Lord uses in the Sermon on the Mount, but the order of the Psalm is almost entirely the same as the order of the sections of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a, a little digression there, and uh, I, I think, you know, Christ is moving a few things around, but for the most part, the order fits. So take a look at this. See what you think about this. So here's Psalm 15. It's about the character of those who dwell with God. And so here's how verse one starts. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? So that's how the Psalm begins. Well, it's interesting then that the Sermon on the Mount essentially begins with the same thing the character of those who will dwell with God, right? Because you look at the Beatitudes that we just read, and the Lord Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? That's, that's dwelling with God, the kingdom of heaven. For they shall inherit the earth. They shall be called the children of God. Being the children of God means you're in God's family and therefore dwelling with God, right? And then he says again in verse 10, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the section that we call the Beatitudes is really a picture of the kind of person that will dwell with God. And that's the question that begins Psalm 15. Who will dwell with you? So that's interesting. Now then, verse 2 of Psalm 15 goes like this. It's answering the question, right? Who will dwell in your holy hill? So Psalm 15, verse 2 now says, He that walketh uprightly. Well, then the next thing of the Sermon on the Mount, interestingly, is the Lord Jesus, after saying who will dwell with God, he then says, ye are the salt of the earth. Right? You, you're meant to be an example, to walk uprightly. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. So the Psalm talks about walking uprightly, and now so does the Lord Jesus. Then the next thing is, and worketh righteousness in the Psalm. So Psalm 15, 2 answers the question by saying, the one who will dwell with God is he who walks uprightly and he who works righteousness. Well, the very next verses in the Sermon on the Mount say, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is where God dwells, right? And so we can see this parallel here between the Psalm asking this question, who will dwell in your holy hill, and then giving an answer, and the Lord Jesus essentially is answering the question too. The psalm then goes on, and still in verse 2, to say, the one who speaks the truth in his heart. Now, what's fascinating is, the next thing that the Lord Jesus does is he has this big section that stretches from chapter 5, verse 21, through chapter 6, verse 34, in which he says, you have heard it said, and he talks about different aspects of the law, right? You've heard it said before, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, whoever looks lustfully on a woman has committed adultery in his heart. And so the Lord Jesus says, look, it's about the heart. This is not about, you know, just having truth in your outward appearance. But he says it's about speaking the truth in your heart. So let's talk about how these commandments affect your heart. So he says, whoever's angry with his brother, right? When, when your heart isn't right. Whoever's committed adultery already in his heart. Love your enemies. That your alms may be in secret, right? Because that's affecting your heart, not the outside. When you pray, don't use vain repetitions. That thou appear not unto men to fast. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so throughout this section, the Lord Jesus is talking about how do these things, how does God's way, how does the truth affect your heart? And that was what the psalm was about. 
The psalm then says, He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So it essentially says, you're going to love your neighbor. Well, so does the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not that you be not judged. Therefore, you know what we call the golden rule, right? All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. And then it condemns the wicked. And it says, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And well, the very next part of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord Jesus saying, beware of false prophets and then depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So you have these parallels here. Now, don't worry, the Psalm's only a few verses long. So we'll go through all the verses. There's not a whole lot more here to see these connections. Verse four says, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. And this is where the, the order goes back a little bit. But the Lord Jesus really does say this, right? He says, let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. You know, your yes should be yes. So people need to know that when you say things, that's what you're going to do, that you will change not, just like what the Psalm says. It also says that he who putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. So, you know, you're not greedy and trying to get things from people. And, well, that's what we just read, right? The, the Lord Jesus says, give to him that asketh thee. From him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So you have all these parallels here to Psalm 15. Just a couple more. Psalm ends by saying, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And so it's interesting then that, did you notice, do you remember? Do you remember how the Sermon on the Mount ends? It ends with a parable. And that parable is with the Lord Jesus saying, he who hears my sayings and does them will be like a man who builds his house on a rock. And well, we know what happens to that man, right? The sun or the, the rain come, the storm come, and well, that man's house is not moved. Right? It, it continues to stay there. And that's what the psalm tells us, that he who does these things shall never be moved. Now, you might wonder, you know, okay, well, that's an interesting thing to see, right? Psalm, psalm 15, that's cool to see that it's the basis of, of the Lord's uh, Sermon on the Mount. But what's that mean? You know, what's the significance of it? Because as we said, Bible study means something, right? Bible study teaches us how to live. So, so what does this teach us? Well, I think that when we can see Psalm 15 as the basis for this, we can actually better understand the Sermon on the Mount because Psalm 15 had a reason that it was written. So once we look at the Psalm and understand why David wrote it, then we can better understand why the Lord Jesus said the Sermon on the Mount. So let's go back and take a look at Psalm 15. So, Psalm 15, we're going to try and understand the historical basis here. This is a, a picture from the city of David. If you've ever been to Israel, you perhaps will recognize what they call the great stone structure there. So it's thought that uh, this would be a picture that is taken perhaps from the house of David. So Psalm 15 was likely written, I think, so this is my, my feeling, that it was likely written when David brought the ark to Jerusalem. And I think that we can show that because there are some strong connections between Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. And Psalm 24 seems pretty certain to have been written when David brought the ark to Jerusalem. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I will fully acknowledge, right, that, that we have to do a little comparisons here. And, you know, you can't say for sure, aha, Psalm 15 was written then. But, you know, I think by making a few of these connections, we can say, eh, probably. Psalm 15 was written then. So here's how Psalm 15 starts, right? Which we just seen. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Well, if you compare Psalm 24 verses three and four, you'll notice there's a lot of similarities. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? You know, it's the same question. Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, right? That's the same as walking uprightly and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. 
So you can see some of the connections, some of the echoes here. And I would just suggest that, you know, the, this reflection here between Psalm 15 and Psalm 40, 24 probably exists because they were written about the same thing. Now, with that being recognized, it seems fairly certain that Psalm 24 was written about the ark. Just look at this verse, right? Lift up your heads, O ye gates. This is Psalm 24, verse 7. And be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Now, there was no time in which the king of glory, you know, during the time of David, when the gates needed to be opened, when the doors needed to be opened, so that the king of glory should come in, except when David brought God's presence to Jerusalem via the ark. And so I think this gives us a pretty strong connection to say, okay, Psalm 24, written about when David brings the ark. So Psalm 15, probably the same thing. Okay. Now, that's helpful because it allows us to see a potential contrast in Psalm 15 between David and Saul. Because when David brought the ark to Jerusalem, I think it would have been very difficult for David to not have thought about Saul. You might remember that when he decided to move the ark, you'll see it there in 1 Chronicles 13, verse 3. 1 Chronicles 13, verse 3, when David decides to move the ark, the reason that he gives for moving it, he says, let's move the ark to Jerusalem. And the reason he gives is because we did not inquire of it in the days of Saul. So you can see this contrast here that David says, let's get the ark because I want it. And we totally ignored it in the days of Saul. So. If Psalm 15 was written about bringing the ark to Jerusalem, it probably has this contrast between Saul and David. And, you know, I think it does. And this helps us, again, to actually better understand the Sermon on the Mount. So here is Psalm 15 again. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And, you know, that was really what drove David. I have up there on, on the screen Psalm 132, verses 4 and 5. Uh, I got that right here. Psalm 132, verses 4 and 5. And, you know, that's where David says, I will not give sleep to mine eyes until I find a place for God to dwell. This is what drove him. You know, he kept thinking, where is God's house supposed to be? And yet, you look at that by contrast with Saul. And Saul didn't care about who was going to abide in God's tabernacle. In fact, he found the people who did abide in God's tabernacle and he killed them. And he said, oh, the ark, well, you know, just leave it in storage for all 40 years of his reign. So there's a contrast. Then he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Well, I think that this is interesting, that idea of speaking the truth in your heart. We talked about that with the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, but I say to you, Here's the spirit of the law. And now it's really fascinating to think that that was what David kept wondering. What, what are the principles? What's the spirit of the law? How does this apply? And maybe you've noticed it before when you've read through the story of Saul and David. But it's fascinating to see how Saul was all about the letter of the law. He wasn't about speaking the truth in his heart. You know, here's some examples. Do you remember, Saul just like loved law. Do you remember when Samuel became really frustrated with Saul because Samuel had said, wait until I come and then we will offer the offering. Saul waits and he gets all nervous and he says, oh, the people, you know, they're going to flee from me. So Saul offers the offering and Samuel says, what did you do? And Saul said, well, I had to offer the offering because the people were leaving. And you can see in Saul's mind, he has this idea I have to offer an offering, right? This offering is going to save me. It, it, it's total legalism. It's the offering that will bring life. That's 1 Samuel 13. The next chapter in 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan goes and fights against a garrison of the Philistines. And Saul, when he sees what's happening, he says, aha, we're going to go attack. 
and anyone who eats will be cursed. So Saul, in fact, like creates his own law as if, you know, that would do something helpful. Like it doesn't even make any sense, but Saul creates his own law. Then later, after everybody's super tired and having all kinds of issues because they didn't eat anything the whole day because of Saul's law, then the people fly upon the spoil is how the King James describes it, which I think is awesome wording. <laughs> They fly upon the spoil and they start eating the animals there without draining out the blood. Now, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what that's saying. I would suggest it probably means that they were cooking the animals with the blood. They probably weren't hungry enough to just start biting animals. <laughs> but, but, you know, the record doesn't actually say. So they start eating them without draining the blood, probably is what's going on. And Saul is told about this and he freaks out and he says, what are you doing? How could you eat with the blood? Don't you understand? That's against the law. He doesn't know why that's against the law, but he just can't believe that they broke the law. So he makes an altar and he says, now start draining out the blood because that's what you have to do. And so this was Saul. You know, Saul was all about the letter of the law. He was all about the rituals and he never understood why. And so there's your contrast in the psalm. He didn't speak the truth in his heart. And David did. Verse three says, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And I mean, isn't that totally Saul backbiting? You know, Saul, I, I always thought this was crazy. In 1 Samuel 18, Saul is going to have David marry one of his daughters. You remember that? And he finds out that Michael loves David. Do you remember what he says? He says, aha. I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him. That's how Saul thought, you know, about his own daughter. Huh. But, but this was it, you know, and he goes up, oh, David, I have something wonderful for you. My lovely daughter who will make your life so good, right? And he's thinking, ha ha, and she'll just ruin your life. So that's backbiting, right? Not only that, you know what I, I have in the text there, 1 Samuel 28, 17 calls David Saul's neighbor. And that's what the psalm says. Nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And David was Saul's neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. I mean, this is totally Saul. Saul loved Doeg, right? And Doeg was totally evil, killing all the priests. And David wasn't that way. He found out about the Amalekite. He said, oh, I killed Saul. And David said, well, you know, the end for you then. David didn't put up with that kind of thing. He didn't put up with the vile people around him. And he honored those who feared the Lord. And then Saul, he that swears to his own hurt and changes not, you know, you can just look through scripture. Saul is characterized by broken vows. Oh, I'll let you marry my daughter. Oh, ah, too bad. Gave her to somebody else. Amazing. <laughs> You know, that's what he did. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Now, okay, I'm going to freely admit, this one's hard, because there's not a whole lot of examples of usury going on. However, what I would, what I would suggest, since we've seen all these other David-Saul contrasts in this psalm, what I would suggest is that Saul's uh, interactions with David were like usury in which he pretends, you know, oh, yeah, I'll help you. I'll be your friend. And yet he's actually trying to get something out of David. And I think that's the spirit of usury, to use somebody, to get something from them more than what you gave. And he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And that really is the opposite of Saul, but not the opposite of David, whose throne will be established forever. So David is bringing the Ark to Jerusalem to this tabernacle that he makes for it. And he's wondering now, how do I meet with God and have a relationship? And he's thinking about these things. And he thinks, well, I can't be like Saul because we see what happened with Saul. And so written in this Psalm is, here's how I need to be. And here's how Saul was. So I have to learn from his non-example. And David is wondering, 
who will dwell in your tabernacle? And so I think he's thinking about the priests. The priests are the ones who dwell in the tabernacle. So how could he be like a priest after the order of Melchizedek, as he was told to be? And so this psalm is the divine answer. That answer is, put aside Saul, who sought to be like the Levitical priests, who sought the ritual, the letter of the law, but didn't understand the reason behind it, and instead speak the truth in your heart. That's what David realized is the key to dwelling with God, to having a relationship with God. And so the Sermon on the Mount is the same way. So the Lord Jesus here puts aside the chief priests who are represented by Saul's legalism, and he says things like, do not be like the hypocrites who stand on the street corners. Do not be like the hypocrites who fast and twist their faces around when they're fasting. And so just like Psalm 15, Christ puts aside the chief priests and he says, let's talk about a changed heart. So that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It is the answer to Psalm 15. It's an expansion of Psalm 15. Do you want to understand how to dwell with God? That's what Psalm 15 is. It's asking, how do we dwell with God? And it gives an answer. And now the Lord Jesus comes in Matthew 5 and he says, and here is the full, complete answer of how to dwell with God. This is what the behaviors look like. This is what your life will look like if you want to dwell in God's holy hill. So this is what we need to do. So Psalm 15, I think, illuminates to us the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. It just, it wasn't just the Lord Jesus, you know, getting up on a mountain and there were a lot of people. So he decides, oh, you know, I'll, I'll tell them a few things about how they misunderstood the law. It wasn't like that. This was the Lord saying, do you want to understand how to dwell with God? Then here's what your life will look like. So that should prompt our question. How do we get this changed heart? And that's Matthew chapter five. So let's take a look. Let's talk about how to change our heart. Now, interestingly, Matthew chapter five, this transformation of the heart is all about getting rid of vengeance and anger entirely. You know, it's not about getting rid of bad vengeance and anger and keeping righteous vengeance and anger. It's about getting rid of it all. And that's what we're going to see. So those who get rid of these things, get rid of vengeance and anger, the Lord Jesus is telling us can dwell with God. And those who don't get rid of these can't. So this is a crucial thing for us to understand. You know, it's not the kind of thing where we can be like, oh, you know, I just got angry again today because I, well, well, I just lost my temper and that happens. No, it can't be, oh, that just happened. It has to be, I want to transform my heart. And yes, I made a mistake because I got angry today. But that's not who I want to be. So, though God may have been a God of vengeance, you've heard it said before that God is a God of vengeance, but the Lord Jesus is going to explain that that's not what a transformed heart looks like. So let's just take a look at the Beatitudes. You know, we just read this, and I want you to think about how these relate to judgment and anger. So this is the Lord Jesus showing what does a citizen of God's house look like? What is a family member? in God's family look like. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice 
and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, look at how Jesus describes his followers. He says they're poor in spirit, they mourn, they're meek, they hunger and thirst after righteousness. They're merciful, they're pure in heart, they're peacemakers, they're persecuted for righteousness, and they're really angry about when God's name, you know, is blasphemed. That's not what he says. You know, I think that that can make us sad when we see that. It should make us sad. But Jesus doesn't say that these people are angry about it. Or that they judge. The Lord Jesus says, if you want to be part of my family, this is how you will look. I don't think vengeance and anger fit there in any of them at all. And so then this becomes a theme throughout. You know, if you just follow through Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Not so that they might see when you get really frustrated and, you know, show everybody what is really true by beating them down in arguments about doctrine. Like, that's not what he says. He says that your light is supposed to shine, that they see your works. And what good works would they see? They'd see you living out righteousness because you'd understand the purpose of the law. They'd see you living by principle. So the Lord Jesus then works through each individual command that was misunderstood, each command in the law, explaining this is what a changed heart looks like. And each time he describes that, he pushes his followers to live in humility and peace, not anger. I mean, just think about this. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, I got to tell you, I think I misread this verse for years and years and years. This is the King James translation. You will notice that newer translations say that earlier manuscripts don't include this without a cause. And I would suggest to you that that's true. That shouldn't actually be there. Because really, have you ever been angry at somebody without a cause? Have you ever, you know, said, wow, I'm really frustrated with them. And my anger is not justified. Probably not, right? Like, you always have some kind of cause. Oh, because he looked at me funny. Or, you know, whatever it might be. We always have some reason. And so, you know, I used to read this verse and say, well, this says without a cause. So as long as I have a cause, then it's okay to be angry with my brother. You know, as long as I can say, well, this is why. I don't think that's what Christ is saying. I think the Lord is telling us, and that's why these manuscripts, this, that's why this wasn't actually there before, is because this doesn't make sense. Nobody is angry without a cause. Nobody comes and says, man, I'm really mad at you. Why? Oh, um, I don't know. Like, that's not, that just doesn't happen that way. So Christ is telling us, in fact, not only does he say you have to be a peacemaker, not only do you have to um, mourn, not only do you have to be poor in spirit, he says explicitly, and if you're angry with your brother, you're in danger of the judgment. Being angry with your brother means you do not have the kind of changed heart that the people who dwell in my tabernacle will have. And so he specifically tells us, you know, we can't have that. So this is what we want to notice. All throughout this, the Lord explains that we need to have this changed heart and that that means no more anger, meaning no more righteous anger. So you look at each of these things, you know, 
all of these sections. He says, whoever looks at a woman lustfully, that's the same kind of idea. Like you have to have the truth working in your heart, transforming who you are, transforming how you see other people. If you cause a woman to commit adultery by divorcing her, right? I mean, that, that was what would happen back then. He says, no, you know, you can't do that. And so you have to treat one another in love. He says, your yes should be yes. Treat one another in honesty. And then look at how he ends. This is how he finishes this section. He says, you have heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? This is vengeance. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. So he actually says, I want you to not only not have vengeance, I want you to do the opposite of vengeance. So that when you feel vengeful, you actually go out and do the opposite of what you wanted to do. You feel frustrated with that brother or sister because of what they said during Bible class? Guess what you get to do? Go and spend time with them. Right? That's, that's what the Lord Jesus is saying. Not, you know, oh, well, I'm not going to see them anymore because they obviously, you know, don't know what they're talking about. And they're, you know, sowing discord and all kinds of problems. And so in case we missed it, look at how Christ caps this section. Check this out. You've heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And this next sentence is very interesting. That ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven. Do you see what Christ is saying? Like, I feel like this is huge in terms of understanding what we're called to do. And this is why it's so important for us to read, you know, because if we, if we just looked at different sections, we could very easily say, oh, well, God says, be holy for I am holy. And so that means that we're supposed to be like God in every respect. The Lord Jesus says, I've given you examples. So we're supposed to be like Jesus in every respect. And just like he got angry, we should get angry. But that's not what Christ says. Christ explains to us that the way that we follow God's example is by not being angry. Isn't that fascinating? He actually says, the way that you are supposed to be like God is not, and his wrath was kindled. He says that section, that belongs to God. You know, God is going to be like that and he can be like that because he knows people's motivations. You don't. So therefore, the way you're like God is by loving your enemy, by blessing those who curse you, not cursing them, by doing good to those who hate you, by praying for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. That is what shows that you're following God's example. There's no more justification for us to say, oh, well, Christ got angry, so I should. Because that's not the example we're meant to follow. That's how we become like God. We're not supposed to be like him in every way. But this is a way that we are. And so here's the last verse of this section. Be therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. And the way that we live that out is when we say, I'm going to put away anger. I'm going to put away judgment. That's how we follow God. So what's it look like? I think Christ told us, you know, if we have a problem with a brother or sister, we don't just keep living life as normal. You know, he says, leave your offering and go back and fix it. He says, spend time with that person. Do the opposite of what you wanted to do. Pray for your enemies. Now, that's where humility comes in. 
we often justify our anger because we'd say, well, look at what this person did. And, you know, I'm standing up for God. But I think really, if we looked deep enough, we'd realize, well, maybe there's also a little bit of pride that's going on here. Maybe there's a little bit of, well, I was offended that they said what they said because it didn't take me into account or my ideas into account. Or, well, I've studied this and I know that they're wrong because I've already looked into it. We have to see who we are, recognize our pride. We have to recognize who God is. And I think that's what Christ goes into in the next section. He says, look, these people are doing all these things to be seen of men, to be seen of men. They're powered by pride. And he says, that's the antithesis of being perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And so Matthew chapter five, he explains, this is how you're supposed to live. Matthew six, he explains, and here's the issue. Our own pride is what comes into it. So he says, don't be like them. You're supposed to be like your father. You're supposed to pray for those who despitefully use you. And so the next thing Christ says is the Lord's Prayer. Do you see what this emphasizes? The Lord's Prayer emphasizes the greatness of God. Just look, almost every phrase here, I put it up on the screen, almost every phrase here emphasizes how great God is. Our Father, which art in heaven, while we're on earth, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. Your kingdom come. You are king. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread because it has to come from you. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors because you're the only one who can forgive. Lead us not into, tem into temptation, but deliver us from evil because you can deliver for yours is the kingdom. Right? The, the emphasis of this prayer is recognizing the greatness of God because that's what humility is all about. You know, Christ says, put away pride. And the way to learn to apply Matthew 5, he says, is to embrace humility. And humility is made up of two things. Recognizing God's greatness, which Christ shows in the prayer, and our weakness. God is great, we are not. That's humility. And so, look at how often you see that in the Lord's Prayer. All these pieces here show us the greatness of God, and yet at the same time, they show us our dependence on him. We have to pray for our daily bread. We have to pray to be forgiven. We have to pray to be delivered because we can't do it. And so the key is recognizing that God is great and we are not. The key to putting away anger is humility. Because when we embrace humility, we're not going to be offended. We're going to be unoffendable. Somebody's going to do something and we'll say, oh, you know, you probably shouldn't have done it like that. We're not going to go over and say, I can't believe you did it like that. Right? Because we're going to recognize, well, God is great, but we aren't. We make mistakes. And so anger, wrath, malice, vengeance, all those things won't be part of our thinking. And so I think the Lord Jesus is showing us here in the Sermon on the Mount, when we ask the question, who will dwell in your holy hill? Who will be part of God's family? He says, the answer is those who put away anger and judgment and instead embrace peace. And how do you do that? You recognize God's greatness and your weakness. <laughs>